and welcome to a new season of Mythmakers. Mythmakers is the podcast for fantasy fans and fantasy creatives brought to you by the Oxford Centre for Fantasy. My name is Julia Golding. I'm an author and screenwriter, but also I run the centre with its creative writing classes and all sorts of other things we get up to. And today I'm joined by my frequent podcast partner, Jacob Renniker, who is over the other side of the pond. I think you sit in, is it Seattle? If I... Seattle, correct. Yeah. Uh, and Jacob, as if you've listened before, you'll know that Jacob is not only very expert on Tolkien, but he also um, works for Ravensburger, who creates some of those wonderful games, which no doubt you've seen and maybe even been given this back in last Christmas. Uh, so, Jacob, welcome. Now, since we last spoke, uh, I've been away in New Zealand on a fantastic, uh, quite a long trip around both North and South Island. So for the very first podcast uh, episode, I thought it would be quite good to think about New Zealand specifically and Peter Jackson and what's been happening there since, well, basically the turn of the millennium and its relationship with Tolkien, because I found the whole experience of being there absolutely fascinating, really, really fascinating. So have you got any experience of New Zealand or is yours all through having watched the films? Mine's all through films, strictly films and special features from Lord of the Rings extended edition. So I haven't, haven't yet. That's on my pilgrimage site, but I haven't quite made it there. So I'm, I'm really interested to hear uh, more about, about your experience there and uh, what you found both while you were there, how it's influenced, how you think the world views Middle Earth, uh, and what while you were there, you saw this film series impacting New Zealand in general. So, yeah, I think that's probably the first place to start with it because it's very clear even now. So, when was the filming? The filming for the very first set of films was 1999 to 2000. 2001. It's that kind of era. So we're talking almost 25 years ago now. And what is fascinating is to see how through a series of quite, um, it's an episode of being, uh, it's a mix of being really determined to make this and some luck in getting funding in Hollywood and all sorts of little elements that came to into being that Peter Jackson went from being this kind of indie, slightly offbeat filmmaker of these kind of horror pieces and offbeat, you know, indie films to being a major director. So if you now go to Hollywood Boulevard, his star is pretty much outside the Oscar venue, the Dolby Theatre. So he's gone from obscurity to being central. And in the sort of slipstream of the Peter Jackson phenomenon, he's built a whole Hollywood in New Zealand. In fact, I think there's a sign in Wellington where he's based, called Wellywood or something. You know, they, they, they know this. So it's not just that he's built a sort of film studio there in an old paint factory in other places, right on top of the airport there. He's also a major investor in Weta Workshop. And Weta Workshop itself is now one of the two leading uh, special effects places. There's them and Industrial Light and Magic, which is George Lucas. I mean, there are lots of other places around the world that do this, but these are two really big players. So they're working on Avatar. They've done King Kong. I mean, they've just done lots and lots and lots of, of films since. And it's it's big. It's impressive being digital. It doesn't matter where you are in a sense, as long as you've got enough computers and talented people. So the industry is built pretty much on Peter Jackson. And the other sort of New Zealander who people know as a director is uh, Taiko Watiti. Watiti, is that his? Have I got that yeah. right? Um, but he doesn't have the same foothold there. I don't see him putting back into, uh, you know, he, an industry yet. Maybe he, maybe he's got plans. So it is very much 
hanging around Peter Jackson. And everywhere we went, there was people talking about him owning land, um, his, his what, he, what he does in employment, some good, some bad. So it's fascinating to find a country so dominated by one name and that one name was made by a set of films from this obscure professor in Oxford. <laughs> you know, it's, it's quite a, a phenomenon, really. I read a very good book as well, um, which I bought at Hobbiton uh, by Ian Nathan called The Making of Middle Earth, which for all of you really keen keenies out there, I do recommend um, it's quite funny because I was reading this book and how it came to be funded by Bob Shea at New Line. Um, there's a bit of um, less desirable funders in the picture before. Um, yeah. Uh, but it ends up with New Line. And I then when I went on to do some meetings in Hollywood, L.A., I met um, Bob Shea's, I think he's his nephew, who I'm working on a project with. So that was quite fun. You know, um, it's not such a big world, the film world, when it gets down to it. So, yeah, it was fascinating to see how dominant Peter Jackson is, even now, 25 years on. Um, so, yeah, if you were going to go to uh, New Zealand, have you got any sort of on your must-see list of things to go to? Having Yeah, that's hard. Speaking of. Yeah, having watched it. Yeah, that's a, so I know that with... One of the reasons why uh, New Zealand made for such a great uh, filming location is the incredible diversity uh, of the landscape, right? So you can, within an hour and a half flight, you can get to, you know, mount, snowy mountains and, you know, the, uh, you know forests, uh, kind of rolling hillsides, uh, sparse terrain. The only thing I don't have is a desert. Uh, so if... So that, yeah, so that, that any of those places, like I would be tickled. <laughs> I mean, Hobbiton is, is, is picturesque. Um, and so that's, that, that, that of course would be fun for more of a, if, if, if on that particular travel day, I was looking to relax a little bit more, uh, and slow my pace. I think that would be great. If I was in a frenetic mood, I would perhaps want to be a little more adventurous and go, uh, hiking the path of Karadrath and yeah, uh, that is quite like that hike. Yeah, no, I mean the funny thing is that even though I sort of think I'm fairly, you know, I did geography at school and I sort of knew a map vaguely of New Zealand, and I'd watched the making of, I hadn't really grasped until I went there exactly how it all works. So if you're planning your check, yeah, tell us if you're planning your pilgrimage. The two islands, the South Island is sort of a, a rounder and fatter island. Uh, it, it's further south, so it's colder. And that's where the dramatic Alp type scenery is. Not that the North Island doesn't have mountains, but it's the, the ones you're thinking of in the fly past. But it's also very, very sparsely populated. So it's real wilderness. You can go to places where... There are no farms, there's no uh, fences, there's no sign of people for miles and miles and miles and miles. It's quite a phenomenon. So if the population is something like, um, don't quote me on this, but it's something like 5 million, only a million of those live in the South Island. The North Island, which is kind of longer and thinner, a bit like a diamond shape, very roughly, um, with Wellington down the bottom and Auckland up the top has everybody else. And a lot of those people are in either Auckland, which is the biggest city, and Wellington. So it, it reminded me a bit actually of Iceland. Iceland has a similar thing, except east to west, where um, a lot of people live around Reykjavik and the rest of the country is fairly empty. So it had that feel to it. And no wonder both places are used for fantasy films because they have so many places you can set up a camera and do a, you know, a 360 pan without seeing anything else. So if you're actually planning to do your Lord of the Rings tour, um, we did it an unconventional way. Most people start up in Auckland and make their way down to Queenstown. Uh, I actually did it the other way around. Why not? Um, so I would say my top five places to go would be in order of visiting them, this is. 
I would go to the lakes around Lake Tekapo, which is quite near Christchurch. So you're on the South Island. And Lake Tekapo and the lake next door to it, whose name escapes me just now, uh, are the lake are there. You see them um, in the, the Hobbit for Lake Town. It's that sort of amazing, really, really blue, wonderful lake. Um, very beautiful. Also a great place to stargaze. Then going down, I'd go to Queenstown, which is like number one. Queenstown is almost everything. It's <laughs> it's almost everything. It's um, the the remarkable mountains. There's a range called the Remarkables are used again and again. They're the barrier mountains for Mordor. They pop up loads of times. They use for um, um, part of the retreat where they, they go up into the hills uh, in Rohan and they get the sword. I'm just trying to remember what that place is near the Paths of the Dead. Um, and then, of course, up at the near Queenstown, if you go along the lake to a place called Glenorchy, this is a couple of hours drive, right up towards the foot of the mountains. There you see Caradras. There you see uh, Z Zirak Zigil, where, you know, Gandalf fought the Balrog. There you see Beorn's house. I mean, it was, it was multi-purpose. Um, bits of Lothlorien. It's absolutely beautiful. I've got it as my desktop saver because it's such a beautiful place. <laughs> you know, it's um, so I highly recommend Queenstown. I mean, there are other places around there. Deer, Deer Heights, Deer Park Heights, which is right on the edge of the town. I mean, you can see the town from there. That was used again and again for where the wargs attacked and where the um, people are um, escaping to... Um, Helm Steep, wending their way through uh, landscape. There's some of those big shots all around there. So Queenstown, you're spoiled for choice. Oh, it's also got um, the Argonath. You know, I could go on. <laughs> um, so now, were you were you doing a kind of self guided tour around? Mainly, uh, but we did there, do okay. a Lord of the Rings safari that day, okay. and run by people there who 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 actually do that, and they have a all of their Jeeps have like Arwen or Saruman as their um, number plates. And I would say that I totally loved the morning. This was New Year's Day. It was the best New Year's Day our family have ever had, where we went off and dressed up and ran at each other with swords, <laughs> family <laughs> bonding stuff, with a right. great guy called Justin um, who, when he found out I knew about Tolkien, got really into us as a family and he just was milking me for information about Tolkien. My family gets like, shut up, mum. I want to talk to you. Yes. Um, but he was really, really good. The afternoon was less fun because um, we, we lost Justin and we're, it was, it was, I preferred the morning. So if I was going to do a half day tour from Queenstown, I'd definitely go to Glenorchy uh, rather than to Arrowtown, which is what we did in the afternoon. Um, anyway, so that's that's probably a bit too minutia for people, but you never know. You might be listening to this thinking, I've got half a day. Where should I go? That's where to go. Go up to paradise. It's literally called paradise. Um, so that's the second place I'd go. And then the other places are on the North Island. So Wellington is spot number three. Wellington has Weta Workshop where you can do a tour of the special effects studio. It's a small tour. It's not anything on the scale of a studio tour in LA or even the Harry Potter tour in London, but it's an interesting tour because it's like the working, you know, the, where, they, where it all comes from. <laughs> uh, and just by there in Wellington, you can go up and see the places where they did some of the early filming in Victoria Park. So the very first shots of um, Lord of the Rings where they're leaving the Shire were filmed just in the backyard of Weta Workshop. Makes you realise just how parochial, how local everything was. And then I would, so that's number, we've got to number three, haven't we? Three, right. Yeah. Number four, I'd actually, so this is where it gets tricky because I know what number five is. There's quite a few places I'd love to go, but I think number four might be Rivendell which is quite close to Wellington. But I just thought the 
the combination of the river valley and the woods, which were sort of a beautiful, fresh green, were very atmospheric. It really felt a beautiful, I mean, you can see why they chose it for Rivendell, because of course Rivendell is that place we all want to go. Um, and I love that very much. And then the absolute top, joint top with Queenstown is Hobbiton. Uh, Hobbiton was so much better than I expected. I mean, just a hundred percent better. I had gone thinking it would be a ersatz kind of Disney experience. I kind of half feared they might have people walking around as hobbits or something, but no, it was really, really well done. Um, they, you meet outside the, the village outside Hobbiton and they take you through in well-timed, you know, coach loads. So you never feel bunched up or crowded. I was there on a beautiful hot day and it looked amazing. They have a team of gardeners who keep it all running beautifully and they've developed it so that it's not just front doors in a hillside. Since December, they've opened up a, a Hobbit hole. So that was never a, Never a Peter Jackson location because the inside places are all built in studios. They've actually replicated their own version of a hobbit hole. And it's huge. It's as big as my house on one floor. Uh, it's got a living room, a bedroom, a bathroom, a dining room, a kitchen, a study. I mean, it's just really, really wonderful. And you can touch everything. You can sit on the beds. You can look at the little props they've made because it is all props. It's nothing is... Of valuable in a sort of it's been in a movie sense but it was wonderful and then you finish at the green dragon which brews its own beer and cider and non-alcoholic drinks and that was really nice really decent beer so um that whole experience was far better i live in a village which is a bit like a kind of hobbiton village we have thatched houses and thatched walls and I guess we're all a bit hobbity with our gardens. And I was going thinking I was going to be a bit kind of, oh, well, you know, I should have stayed at home. But actually I thought, no, 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 this is really well done and um, highly recommended. So if there's just one thing that you do in New Zealand involving Lord of the Rings, do go to Hobbiton. It's well worth it. Really is. Excellent. Well, that sounds great. Um, I'm really interested to hear maybe – what struck you being at some of those different locations that you knew so well from the film? What sort of additional insight, feeling, I don't know, perspective did you get when you were at, say, like, you talk about Lothlorien in particular and Hobbiton. So some of these places, what were their, were, were their meaningful, I don't want to say like differences or things that in your imagination or from where we saw it through the camera, what was different from that experience versus actually being there on the ground uh, that, that struck you? Yeah, I mean, I don't know what you think about the difference between the first trilogy and the second trilogy, so um, Lord of the Rings versus The Hobbit. In the, it, it really brought to mind how important it is to actually go into locations. So, for example, in um, Rivendell, a lot of it in the studio doesn't work as well for me as the bits when they're outside. And even with the best kind of lighting you still get that sense of expansiveness and like a breath of fresh air mm. when it is actually in the real place and they're standing in a location. Um, so obviously there's no longer any of this, the sets have gone, you know, cause it's, it's a natural beauty spot, but you can sort of put them back in, in your mind and see how they pieced it together. And it made me think that one of my problems with, the Hobbit. I mean, there's a several things with The Hobbit. One was the very overextended storytelling, which is probably its fatal flaw. But there was also the the punched up colours because of the particular frame rate that was used, which also made it feel a bit unreal. Right. Though having said that, colours in New Zealand do sometimes feel unreal because they're so... I mean, I've, I've printed them off and put them on the wall. I thought, hang on, that looks like I've put a filter on them. But no, they, they do come out like that. Um but also the use of a lot of computer generated mm. scenery and interiors and, and characters running through like a sort of video game style. 
And it made me just think, oh, it's so much better doing it old style where somebody's actually in a muddy field um, or in a local park. Or I just thought that that approach the first time round, I know it was hard, hard for the actors, unreliable weather. You can see why people take these choices, but it did make it feel so much more authentic to the book because the book is all about moving through a landscape and the difficulties of walking, the sore feet, the the roots poking you in the back, you know, all those things which make it feel a very grounded fantasy. So, yeah, going going there made me think, oh, yeah, they got it right the first time round, didn't they? I think that was my feeling. That's great. Yeah, the, the difference between filming on location and filming in front of a green screen you're right that there's there's a lot of different factors that come into play and certainly with fantasy uh films in particular uh is oftentimes dependent upon spectacle computer generated images so it's it's more convenient sometimes but certainly there's a, there's a different feel and i know that since uh you know peter jackson film lord of the rings there that that more films have filmed in New Zealand, um, ones that would be perhaps relevant to this audience. Uh, the first two Chronicles of Narnia films were filmed in New Zealand, um, as were, as were the first two Avatar, uh, films. So when they did, although Avatar does heavily, heavily use yeah. CGI, uh, Chronicles of Narnia, not so much, right? Um, uh, but in utilizing that landscape for a kind of a more fantastic, heightened sense of reality, there's something, yes, yes, you can create that digitally, but uh, you're right. There just seems to be kind of a different feel, just as it seems to be a different feel when you have uh, practical puppets that you're working with, that you're acting mm -hmm. alongside and not just somebody holding a tennis ball, which is where, you know, the Andy Circus and in that book that you mentioned that talks about, you know, what his process uh, and how transformative that was for the actors to actually have him there in the scene and not just have sit, not just tell the actors look look in this general direction this person's going to be talking to you but actually having the person there to interact with uh that that is yeah. uh tremendously helpful as you know as a person as a human being who's conditioned to respond to physical environment and stimuli like that you just you can't help but lose something when you're filming and just having to just imagine it versus feeling, like you said, kind of like feeling the sun, feeling the wind, uh, and being there with your feet on firm ground and actual trees and rocks and, uh, mountains around you. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to take it away from the very clever people who build sets and, uh, the people who do the digital effects. I mean, they do an amazing job and I imagine there are quite a few things I don't notice, which I think are real and actually were never there because they've got so good. But I think in terms of performance, that feeling of water being wet and sun being hot and cold, you know, it just it just feels it brings something else out, I think, in performance. Um, anyway, so yeah. I think one of the other things which I, I wanted to ask you about is do you think actually the such a strong association between New Zealand and Middle Earth is a good thing for readers of Tolkien because in a way it skewed our whereas before we all had our own private little imaginations about what Middle Earth was like unless you've I think it's almost impossible to avoid any imagery from the films now but almost all of us now are seeing it through a New Zealand lens do you think that's a bad thing or a good thing well, it's an interesting uh, question because I know with uh, Rings of Power, you know, they started filming in New Zealand, right? Because, because of that, because of that, you know, kind of culturally embedded tie between Lord of the Rings, Tolkien and New Zealand. But then they moved filming to the UK and that there was an uproar among certain, you know, loud segments of, uh, Lord of the Rings fans on how could you possibly move it from New Zealand? It is the one true and living uh, embodiment of Middle Earth. So I think there's certainly people who would would want that. Um, it's it, like you said, it's impossible to get around that imagery. If you're coming to Tolkien through uh, the films first, uh, then of course that's going to color how you imagine 
the words themselves of the book, uh, but even vice versa, you know, when you're reading, having read, uh, you know, the books first, it's still hard to sometimes disentangle your purely, you know, self-generated imagery, which is, which is much like what AI is doing, right? When you're reading a book and you're putting images in your mind, you're just scraping all of your previous memories from films, from places you've been, and you're kind of doing, creating some sort of imaginary composite in, in your own mind for what this book would look like um, in your mind's eye. So it, it's hard if you're going back and revisiting that, it's hard to keep that original pristine self uh, amalgamated image of what this looked like with what you've seen on the big screen because it's so visually power, you know, powerful and arresting, especially if you saw it on the big screen because it's even more <laughs> probably imprinted on your uh, retinas uh, and imagination because of the scope and scale that you saw it at. So it's hard to disentangle those. So I think it's, yeah, it's inevitable that there will, that there will be a connection there but the scope and the audience, right? The, the, just the sheer number of people that saw those films versus rings of power, which there's a significantly fewer audience space. And so in them moving their filming to the UK, it's, uh, I, I don't know that it'll have as big of a cultural impact in how we view middle earth. And especially, you know, there's, there's really a lot of, um, you know, heavy reliance on CGI, especially, um, when you're looking at different cities, um, mm. uh, Numenor in particular, right? So that, you know, the striking visuals that are entirely CGI because unfortunately we don't have large <laughs> scale. You don't have basically Atlantis anywhere. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So, yeah, so it's a good question. So is it is, is that a good thing to excuse our imagination I, uh, or our knowledge of Tolkien, how we view it? I, I imagine, you know, as we're reading the books, it's a personal individualized experience. Um, even if you've seen the films, it's, it's hard not to, or even rings of power. It's hard not to use those images to fill your own imagination, um, which is useful. I think any, any more grist for the mill uh, of your imagination is, is a good thing. Um, and then it's just, I guess, yeah, uh, it's, it's inevitable. I suppose it's inevitable, <laughs> uh, at, at this point, just because of the culturally, how far, those images kind of seep. So I'd be interested to see how, if, uh, as, as they're producing additional Lord of the Rings films, how much the imagery that they use there and their filming locations play into the larger kind of cultural imagination of Tolkien, which has evolved over the past, you know, 40 uh, plus years. So I'd be, I'm very interested to see how it continues to evolve with additional films um, including animated uh, yeah. Tolkien films. Well, that's true. I mean, of course, the, we should also put in uh, this space the uh, huge influence that John Howe and uh, Alan um, Lee had on the... Alan Lee? Is that the right? Yeah. Yeah. Just having a, a moment, but I think... Is that the right name? Um, had on the way it was then interpreted. Um, so it's come... It's as though they drew it then... Mm, New Zealand found it on in the in the and uh, you know it's it's that kind of co combination. So it did start off as a, a painterly approach, and of course anybody who's bought um, Tolkien books or calendars over the years will know there are other artists available who do a different version of. So there are other ways of imagining Middle Earth um, that can be sort of laid upon our imaginations as well. It's hard to get away from it, though. I find it easier to kick to the curb character faces of some of the characters because um, the hobbits weren't cast as they are in the book. You know, Frodo's too young, um, Sam's too American, frankly. Um, you know, his sensibility isn't quite... Uh, you know, I can quite easily make him into something else in my head because I already had quite a firm... For you harder with Gollum, um, hmm. because Gollum seemed a more spot on performance, though I am quite fond of the BBC audio drama version as well. Um, yeah, so but the landscapes are tricky, and I'd actually really welcome in my lifetime, <laughs> it sounds a bit dramatic, uh, but I would welcome a different place to stand in for Middle Earth just so that we can break the. Hmm. I don't, I mean, it would be really nice to see somebody else interpret 
the books in a new way, finding just so that we can sort of have more than one version of this in our head. A bit like you don't want just one Hamlet performance or one with Summer Night's Dream. It's fun to see it set one place and then another place. And um, one of the things that I have always obvious easy gains for me would be to actually take seriously that these are places where people live. So um Edoras, though it's an amazing location, it doesn't seem to be it's very, very isolated. And there's not much sense of a lived landscape around it. And it's that's even so true of um Minas Tirith, which we know from the book has a, a wall around it and farms. It's much more like the Battle of Waterloo happening on a an existing series of farms. So you could actually go more historic and actually have traces of people in the landscape more rather than these vast plains, which I know are easier to am- animate. Um, they haven't got pesky things in the way, um, but that's not how it's described in the books. Uh, and also, I think the other thing I would do which is taken from living in a landscape which has lots and lots of layers of history in it. When they do put history in the landscape there, it's very much, oh, here's a bit of architecture that's been left behind. But actually in the book, you're you're dealing with old roads and Mm. you get the old forts, but you've got the barrows. And um, I live near some old Roman roads, which are sort of hidden under the grass, but there is a, a discernible road there. So you could quite easily... Um, think again. I think it's a, doing the more historic version as opposed to the fantasy version. That'd be fun to see. And for me, that would be a fresh take, more uh, believable, and it perhaps could help give me another version to think about. You know, just set it up in Scotland or I, you know, the Isle of Skye. Got some nice pointy mountains up there. Um, I think Tolkien himself was partly inspired by a visit to the Alps. So you could actually have some of the Alpine um, mountains as your, you know, your amazing landscapes. That's not so very far away. What about in America? You've got lots of that could be set. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big, it's a big, it's a big country. Um, I think one of the landscapes that has the greatest diversity, um, Utah is great for like, you know, incredibly high mountains, arid deserts, um, forest spaces. So there's, there's a reason why a lot of, uh, films are, uh, set there. Um, uh, yeah. And I think it, it depends on the type of film, but for, for Lord of the Rings in particular, kind of the more harsh, dramatic, um, imagery does work well so there um forests and whatnot uh you know if you're in the eastern united states uh uh, atlanta so georgia is another popular filming location for a lot of uh, shows where there's uh, emphasis on woods um that's good uh and just north of the united states just north of seattle uh, vancouver is another uh popular uh, location yeah yes right right yeah 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 so that's again because like the woods uh, the scenery, um, a little less populated, so it's easier to film there. So all of those you know, uh, locations have places where you can film without running into lo- loads of people and having to remove them mm-hmm. digitally. Um, but it does seem in thinking about, yeah, a- adaptations that, uh, for Hollywood films, right. For big, big budget films that the more dramatic, the, landscape the better right the more arresting the visuals whereas where you're looking at kind of like long form uh television or limited series uh you don't need to have as much dramatic uh dramatic environment because there's more emphasis on individual characters and you can spread out over more characters so it seems like if you're looking at you know the farmland that's surrounding um menace here at that it'd be easier in a, if you're to do kind of like a limited series or turn, you know, Lord of the Rings into a uh, uh, television, into a series instead of films that you could spend more time on the ground and looking at some of those, you know, slower, slower scenes, um, uh, landscapes that aren't as visually jarring, arresting, or particularly memorable, but there is something tonally that happens when you slow down and can focus on character interactions in a different setting like that so yeah so i think i think it would be fun i agree with you that'd be fun to see someone else do a different take on 
the Lord of the Rings on where it is placed visually. Uh, there are certain elements in the in the book itself that certainly deserve to be highlighted there that could help shape how we view the story and what the characters are experiencing. That's a very good rationale, actually, because in a way, I feel the films are such a good version that it's very hard to go into competition with them. Whereas the rationale of having a long long form TV series where you're not needing to do your sort of huge David Lean you know, sweeping landscapes. Um, you would put them in, but you don't need to have them every three minutes or whatever. The exactly. The hit rate yeah. is, and I don't know, it's probably a bit more than that, 10 minutes. Um, okay, well, that's uh, that's very helpful. Thanks. Uh, that's a really good idea. And we are both available <laughs> to, yeah, to organise the, the locations for the next version of this between us. I'm sure we can come up with a good list. Right. So um, we're going to finish on our top fantasy tip. Um, so Jacob, where would you say is in your backyard? And I'm allowing you the whole of the United States as your backyard. Oh, wow. That's as quite generous. Where's the place you've gone and thought, wow, this feels so much like something I've read in Tolkien. Um, yeah, I think it would, it, it would actually be, uh, see again, so in, in the United States, and it's actually in the, in the Pacific Northwest of Seattle area, the uh, Olympic Peninsula is a uh, actual, uh, natural rainforest in North America. Um, so just, you know, giant, uh, giant trees, uh, you know, this just really ancient feel, uh, to it. So, you know, so parts of that Fanghorn forest. Um, even parts love Lorien S, but just in terms of kind of like the natural green, just kind of, you know, this, like the hum of a uh, living natural world, um, uh, is certainly present there and close runner up, uh, the redwood, uh, forests in, uh, California, uh, yeah. where they have, you know, those redwoods are massive. So those in terms of spectacle and scale, just massive, ancient, uh, trees, different feel. It's more spread out more airy in the um in the redwoods and more dense in see like the the rainforest uh in the northwest so those are the ones yeah that i think for me uh definitely would have, have evoked that sense of uh of kind of a middle earth uh sen sensibilities the spirit of, of middle earth how about for you yeah so i've given my um new zealand tips but actually in my own backyard uh, and literally in my backyard where I walk my dog <laughs> every day is the downs. That's what's missing in um, New Zealand because the downs are a huge part of uh, the Fellowship of the Ring. So you've got fog on the downs, the barrow, right, whites and so on. And even actually Rohan is quite like the downs. And it was the kind of backyard for where where you go if you were talking living in Oxford, you can drive out to see the downs. And what the downs are, are rolling green hills. Um, and on top of the hill is an ancient track called the Ridgeway, which was an old droving road. And there are lots of like Roman forts and, well, an old temple, in fact, and burial mounds and things still left in the landscape. And even though we're in a densely populated part of the world you can still find views where you don't see hardly anything in fact um just at the back of my village where i live now um they filmed the battle scenes in for napoleon the film the recent film because you could do this point a camera and run horses across the the fields without there being anything in the shot um and we you know i'm only a not that far from London. So it's one of those little pockets of landscapes. So I, I'd suggest going to the Downs. Not spectacular, but very Tolkien-esque, very atmospheric. Right, well, thank you very much, Jacob. And thank you for talking to me about Peter Jackson and Middle Earth and many other location scouting between us as well. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Mythmakers Podcast, brought to you by the Oxford Centre for Fantasy. Visit OxfordCentreForFantasy.org to join in the fun. Find out about our online courses, in-person stays in Oxford, plus visit our shop for great gifts. Tell a friend and subscribe wherever you find your favourite podcasts worldwide.